take a basic set of ideas, categorize them, standing still, stepping, shifting, Taisabaki movement. You've got this whole syllabus on basics that you can build. Critical to build this because it improves your cutter, it improves your muscle coordination. It allows you to develop more mobility. Onigashimasu. Welcome back to the Kojuri Karate Center. So, today's class, I stole some of the ideas. Right, so, without further ado, we're going to be doing basics in preparation for uh, trying to elevate the general standard in your dojo and basics uh, for various grades and ideas and concerns that instructors may have in terms of how to do certain basics. So it's not specifically white to yellow belt basics or yellow to orange belt basics, but basics in general. And when we use the word basics or fundamentals or kehon, we are talking about exercises that are often repeated in a linear fashion or moving or shifting. Let us get started. So standing basics, our first set of exercises would be standing, most likely starting in a neutral stance such as heikodachi, and you would always start with probably punch. So you've got uh, Chokozuki or Seikenzuki or Shomenzuki and you would do a single punch and you could have variable heights. So Jodan, Chudan, Gedan. Things that we look for a lot of the time is the chamber hand. How is the speed of the chamber hand returning. What you want to try and have is a 50-50 balance. So as you punch, you've got the same amount of power going forward as you've got going backwards. And that helps develop a balanced punch. And from there, if we're staying with the punch, we can then move on to two times single punch. So two times single punch. Okay, trying to encourage hip movement and getting people used to doing repetition, okay? Then we can have double punch, where the first one is often basically complete and the second one gets five. There's less focus on the end point. Thereafter, we can have triple punch. So three times single punch would be Triple punch. So you're trying to build a set of muscle memory exercises. And you've got to go from one to the next to the next to help develop good muscle strength. Obviously, all the punching is meaningless if it is not executed against something harder than fresh air. So ideally, sponge pad, punch bag, makiwara, to help condition the joints systematically. Please go look at my video on introduction to makiwara to get an idea of what we're doing with this. We can then move from neutral to a stance. And you could use any stance for basics. So you could do single punches and now what's happening is you're starting to encourage a little bit of rotation off the hip joints which is better so we can use sanchen dutch oizukis and gyakuzukis at various levels to help develop and the same thing in zenkutsu dutch shiko dutch becomes a little bit different because if I'm on a 45 in terms of partner work later down the track, I'm more than likely going to be between here and here. So, but it's very impractical <coughs> to do this other than in a class setting to build spirit. Okay, so you often see students in the dojo, this exercise is to develop your fighting spirit, your ki, -ai, your team spirit, as well as your leg strength. Cat stance, same thing. So all of these are static. 
So in doing your basics, neutral, then favoring one leg, and then obviously you would repeat and change legs. Um, you're trying to build a static position. Punches like the jab, kizamizuke, can also be practiced, as well as uh, the, natural, the, 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 the natural extension of punches would be maybe nukite, palm strike, because all of these have the same kind of trajectory and the arms doing the same basic movement. What would often happen is you would have standing, stance, <clears throat> and then you will start with stepping. And the moment we get into stepping, what tends to happen is we tend to build very, very basic. And then either our students don't do enough time doing basics or they do so much basics that they don't learn anything else and you've got to find the balance and this is the tricky part about being a good teacher and being a, a true sensei and I'm going to say this from a point of view of being an academically trained teacher um, which I would consider a true teacher um, because that's your vocation, it's your job, it's your livelihood. Um, you have a different sense of the necessity to create an environment that that is 100% conducive to learning and growth. Sometimes a dojo cannot be this. Sometimes a dojo has to be a place where everybody is surviving, and other times the dojo has to be a place where everybody is coming to learn and everybody is comfortable learning. And it changes, it ebbs and it flows. And knowing when and how much to do is the critical part of finding the balance between the magic and the science. Right, so I'm covering the science, but you've got to balance out the magic, okay? The volumes. So stepping, well, what is very common, it would be like sunch and dutch, and you would just step and punch. There would be various ways of stepping. So um, typical of OGKK would be a more direct kind of step and the punch following afterwards. And if you were retreating or moving backwards and doing a blocking technique, you would then have the foot coming in and out. Now, typically what we see there is that we're starting to get into a prescribed section of work like Sanborn Kumite, Sanborn Zuki Kumite, and Sandangi. These are fantastic as a starting point, but what you need to do is you need to use them as a place to work from. So this builds a stepping basic program. Typically in Sanborn uh, Kumite, you would do maybe three or six repetitions. So I would do Jordan three times or six times. So oh, I'll do another two. There we go, to six, backwards. And then we would do Chudan. Six and backwards. So look at all of our basic videos to get an idea of how this kind of works. I think that's six. I actually, I did seven. Okay, so <clears throat> six forward, six back. And you've got the first tier. And then you would repeat that entire process and you would go through long stance. So you would be long stance, one, two, and I'm just gonna say that would three or six, and then backwards, one, two, three. And we'd go through the next level and the same thing on backwards, and then get done, and backwards, and then we'd repeat for shikodach as well as for cat stance. Now the natural progression in prescribed exercises usually is to treble what happens with one step. So the next exercise would be three times, three times. And so we'd then work on the treble. And you get to a point where you can only do this so many times and your students know what's coming, your students become proficient at it, and they're getting good at it, but 
you know, they're losing the spice and the flair. So it's important to use it as a point of departure for the next series of exercises. So this is where I've taken my ideas from. I've stolen some of the ideas from my friend down at Palm Court Karate Center, Sensei Mario Sequeira. And these are some of the ideas that he finds are very important to help uh, students uh, build and develop their kehon. And if it's missing and lacking, then what you tend to find is that the students struggle later on. And during our discussions as instructors and part of our instructor's training, we, we're looking at the importance of these exercises, even though they may not carry direct relevance to our kata, or direct relevance to fighting, or direct relevance to self-defense work, but that they are part of the process of becoming a better karate person. The next set of ideas would be something simple like Oizuki Gyakuzuki. Oizuki Gyakuzuki. Oizuki Gyakuzuki. Oizuki Gyakuzuki. Oizuki Gyakuzuki. Oizuki Gyakuzuki. So first and probably the most important thing for students to start learning the difference of is this idea of punch, punch, and on the next count, resetting and reusing that hand. From time to time, we will find that we've used one hand and we're going to have to use it again in another place. And it helps prepare the brain for the fact that this hand is going to have to be reused somewhere else. Uh, I'm going to take an example from the kata, see sorsion. You have got this hand doing punch of the shoulder and then you step and it does the next technique first and then this hand comes out. So this hand gets the punch, then the block and then the strike. So where do you learn or where does your brain learn how to do that starting the next move with that hand? It comes from doing lots of basics. And something I brought up with Sensei Mario when we were talking about this, thank goodness we had great senseis in our upbringing of karate uh, because they drilled a lot of this into us. And for years, these things just seem natural to us. While a lot of our students and people below us were really struggling with it. And the thing that we've come to understand is that the importance of these exercises is built in repetition and ritualized training. Okay, so yes, for all the guys out there who are exponents of other martial arts or other activities who are looking at it going, all right, my punch will knock your punch out. That's not the point. The point here is how do we use these basic ideas and basic exercises to improve the overall art, the overall artistry within karate do or karate jutsu and how and where do we take the relevance from good strong pullback if you believe the pullback is because it's giving you power you're welcome to that belief if you believe the pullback is giving you more effect because there's something in that hand coming back great then we're on the same page all right we don't necessarily always spill all the beans all the time so we had our first idea there, which was oizuki and gyakuzuki. The same idea then gets pushed through and it becomes very critical in same arm, same leg, block, punch. So, block, punch. So this idea of just block, counter, block, punch. And, yeah, it looks so, it's like, why, why do you do that? You know, some people might say, well, it looks like you're just practicing Gyakuzuki for sport. Um, please note, Sancho. Oh, it's there again. All right. And if you wanted to see Sorshan Sansaru, say San Superumpe and Tensho. This idea of blocking and holding with one hand, um, it comes from our most important basic cutters. So 
we take it from there. Yes, you can take it from a heian or a few cucutta. All right. I know somebody's going to be saying blasphemy. But yeah, it is built, it is part of good common basics. So our first step after we step away from a lot of the prescribed uh, kehon that you see like sanborn and sanbonzuki and sandangi would be now to start escalating. I like sanbonzuki because it helps me start developing ideas that are important. The next thing I like to do is we never do enough kicks. And the problem with uh, having a look at gradings of our students, especially the last two or three years when we've noticed there has been a consistent issue with the ability to kick. And that is not lack of student ability only. That is a lot to do with not getting down to teaching and working and drilling and ritualizing the difficult topic and content called kicks. So it's important for students to practice kicking both against fresh air to get an idea of the concept and then against something tangible again. The bag, the focus pad, the paddle, these all become critical parts of our training so that we become more proficient at what we're doing. Okay, so just kicking, let's say my Gary, and then going back, front foot kick back, front foot kick back. And what I would do would be run through the stances again so that I am working consistently on two things. In this case, stance as well as the kick. And it might not seem like much, but that rotation, that kick, rotation is critical. Going backwards, kick and back. Kick and back. And you can apply this through all the kicks. My Gary, he's a Gary. <laughs> Kansets Gary are for purest goju, the kicks that appear in the majority of our kata. And thereafter, my Tobi Gary and maybe a crescent kick, a kikato Gary. But it's also important to practice the kicks that don't occur in goju kata. Kicks like Mawashigiri. Now, it does not have to be a Jordan Mawashigiri. If your student is 60 years old, teach them to kick a good Gedan Mawashigiri for the knee. If your student is a little bit younger and a little bit more supple, get them to kick for the ribs. If they're very young and supple and flexible and they've got all the ability and the understanding of the pivot, then maybe teach them Jordan. And as they grow older, the kick will come down. All right? But the idea of a good roundhouse kick. I'm doing a particular type of roundhouse kick now, emphasizing the hinging motion and the pickup from the ground and kicking around. So this may not be everybody's cup of tea. I'm also trying to kick with the ball of my foot and bring my foot down. I don't like kicking and landing in my original position because of the load on the support leg. You've pivoted one way, and if you're kicking a little bit more seriously, something hard, what's gonna happen when you try and pull it back? You're putting a lot of load on the joints and the ligaments to retrieve that foot, and you're gonna end up hurting that leg. I would rather err on the side of kicking and stepping down. And that way you can always work on super controlled kick with a touch or a tip or a tap, or if you really had to, a kick that will follow through maybe one foot and then allow you to put down and still not have lost too much position, which helps if you're trying to do something that's a little bit more full contact orientated. Okay, so the roundhouse kick. I'm going to go through the center for the side kick. Now, I don't think that there is a difference between a thrusting side kick 
and a sidekick. But I do believe that a snapping sidekick where you're trying to raise the leg up is not great for your body. I don't think the body is meant to bend that way. Um, so I have like, well, I do gorgery. It doesn't occur in any of my kata. It doesn't really occur in my basics, so I don't really have to do it. But if you're a shorter kind of exponent and your sensei is asking you to do this, well, you have to do as your sensei says, theoretically. Um, but please always consider the longevity of your joints, your knees, and your hips. So from here, trying to kick in a straight line, I'm going to bring my leg up. I'm going to get to the same position, drive my foot forward, and then drop back down. And the idea is, again, is kick and drive. And try to kick with the heel and the underside of the foot. I'm not a fan of this uh, kicking with the blade of the foot that you see. It's putting the foot in an unrealistic plane. And when you hit something, it might get damaged. It's quite possible to turn the foot like that for Kansetsugeri, but I err on trying to kick with my heel all the time because my body is built and is conditioned by doing this. We don't do this very often. We can stretch this. We can develop it. But I don't think that is going to make, doesn't make anatomical sense. It's that simple. Um, when you can show me how this works anatomically and suddenly gets stronger, I'll understand, but it doesn't. And if you speak to somebody who does a lot of ankle and foot surgery, they'll tell you this is where ankles get sprained and broken, etc. So kicking something really hard, chances are you're going to run an injury. We're built with this in mind. And so I like the idea that I'm kicking with my heel. And should I be kicking here, I want to kick with that heel. I want to push that heel forward. That would cover roundhouse kick, side kick. A lot of people just practice stationary back kick. Uh, some people would prefer to do back kick this way. And that's up to you. Uh, this is getting a little bit more advanced, and it's the sort of thing that you would work. Uh, I would say try and work as much as possible on a sponge or a pad because it forces a person to kick accurately. When you kick fresh air, you start seeing people's feet going off at angles because they're busy turning, 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 and kicking, and they don't realize they've kicked there instead of there. So there I would err on the side of using some kind of focus implement, a focus pad, or a bag, because it's going to force your, your kicker to get the angles 100% right. Where do we get to after that? We start putting it all together. And this is where you start allowing yourself to be a little bit creative as an instructor. You're still on the same uh, pattern, but you're now building um, the idea by elevating it. And this is now forcing your students to work that little bit harder. So typically what I would be doing with uh, one kick and three hand techniques would be a kick, a punch, maybe a block, and a block if I wanted, okay? It doesn't always have to make combative sense, but what it has to do is bring in variety. Or kick, block, punch, block. And this makes it, you know, this might be a one, one or two tiers lower where you're doing kick, Block, punch, block. And this helps develop muscle memory. It helps the student to develop their basics, their kehon, over time. And you use all the stances. So you imagine you could do one idea, run through it, and just run through Sanchen at three levels, Zenkusudach at three levels, Shikudach at three levels, and uh, Cat Stance at three levels. And that's a good 10 minutes of stepping basics in the dojo. Our next concept that we like to talk about is shifting basics. And it's important to understand that if you're going to study gorgery karate, as much as you do forward and backwards basics, you have to do shifting basics. Shifting basics starts with step and pull, step and pull, step and pull, step and pull. Then step, pull, turn, and I'm immediately in Sanchen Dutch. Step, pull, turn, you're immediately in Sanchen Dutch. And the important part of this 
is the development of the understanding that the student will need to move to get out the way of an attack. They will then have a leg that's in front. The next thing you have to build, and even though it looks like basic karate or shotokan karate or even sport karate, again, it comes from Sanchen Kata, is the idea of block punch. And when I move again, that re-block punch, 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 re-block of punch or strike. And you can just go from there. Um, the stepping's the same. It's just building that muscle memory. The next thing that you build is step, turn, pull, and sit. And you've got cat stops. And so we're now effectively doing the stepping from Gixai Daini Kata at the end of the Kata. So this is important because we use this a lot. And when you start doing basic Bunkai for grading, one of the most important things you're going to see, Gixai Daich typically looks like one, two. Later on in the kata, one, two, or one, two. So you're getting this idea of the feet moving. People often will not understand stepping across their midline for the point of getting away from an attack. A lot of people will prefer to keep their body facing their opponent. So that's basic, a little bit more advanced, would be when you step across the line this way. Okay, so uh, a lot of the time with Sensei Terio Chinin practicing Pakwa, and the idea from Pakwa would be that if the right side was attacking, I would be moving out the way and blocking like this. And this is a progression to another position. So then you start doing things like figure of H training. One, two. One, two. So I step, I cross the diagonal, I swivel around. Step, cross the diagonal, and I swivel around. <clears throat> this is going to help develop your mobility in three-dimensional movement around your opponent. And this is another key facet of what makes Gorju. Gorju is that we often are not retreat, 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 then counter, 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 which you see in Sanborn, Sanborn Zuki, Sandangi. But more importantly, a lot of the time, good fighting will develop the idea of moving softly to one side and around. So it's easier to develop the more direct, hard, gore components of stepping basics, and it's harder to develop the dew component, the softer side. And a lot of the time we think we're just doing it okay if we're doing cat stance. But a lot, a lot more emphasis should be put on tai sabaki and shifting around your opponent, which is the next idea that you should have somewhere in your basics, is the idea that I need to shift and move in, back. Shift and move in. So I'm getting off the line of the attack, soft movement, and then moving in. The moment we start getting more advanced footwork for Tai Sabaki, we also have to start getting more advanced technique with our hands. So you may find that the person does two-hand block and then hurricane hook as they step through. So we go from soft to hard, soft to hard. We absorb, we retaliate. And so you start building your basics on these principles. The nutshell of all of this is if you're an instructor and you're trying to figure out how best to do basics because there is no textbook and there's so much variety out there, my point of departure for this video is take a basic set of ideas, categorize them. We're going to steal Sensei Mario's categorization. Standing still, stepping, 
shifting. All right. Um, Thai Sabaki movement. Add in impact work and add in partner work. And you've got this whole syllabus on uh, basics that you can build. It's critical to build this because it improves your cutter, it improves your muscle coordination, it allows you to develop more mobility. I'm going to leave it there for now. I think we're probably going to be creating a few more videos with a few more ideas for stepping basics, moving basics, shifting basics that would be used and can be developed by a students for home training and other instructors for the idea of building a good solid system and keeping your students uh, working hard but also thinking on their feet because it's not always the same thing. That's it for tonight folks. Arigato gozaimasu. Thank you very much for all the likes, the subscriptions, the comments and um, yeah if you'd like to leave a comment Hopefully, we'll have some uh, interesting bits available for you. Arigato gozaimasu.